Hi, by the way. Just getting set up. Uh, I am in Alan's office today. <laughs> Empty office, actually. Uh, because we have filming. And they took up all the space, so this is where I'm hiding. How are you, and how is your, uh, how's your needle binding going? I put up a picture of embroidery because needle binding. <laughs> uh, this is what mine looks like from last week. I didn't get very far. Uh, but I sold, I think every wrist warmer I had in the store went uh, last week because we've had cold weather. So I had to abandon this with a good excuse. I'll come back to it though. And make wrist warmers. This is only half. Hey, Max! These ones, they're not done yet. I've decided to make them top down because I didn't know how much of this yarn I had and uh, when I was at home in Vespi. And then when I came out here, I uh, found I had a lot more of it, so I have to add on to the end. But whenever I don't know how much yarn I have, I like to start with the good stuff at the, and go top down. Normally, I make wrist warmers this way. But they're super fast with Oslo. Uh, and I managed to cut my finger. <laughs> but it's not bad. Anyway, I have to pull up the chat so I can see. I was a little rushed today, but made it. Live chat. Okay, now I can see who's here. I actually got the link up early, but I didn't actually get the um, post early this time. And when I say early, I mean like a couple hours because I'm horrible. Albert's here. He looks like he was the first one on my screen, so congratulations, Albert. And Torben is a quick second, and Charlotte is a quick third. And I did notice that when I went to go and post it on Facebook and stuff that there was already three people waiting, so I'm assuming it was you three. You guys are good. You had found it before I could um, post it anywhere. Garcia is here, too. Are you guys freezing, or is it just us? I mean, like, my fingers are still red <laughs> from being outside uh, spinning. You don't spin in cold weather. Needle binding was one thing, but... And then I stupidly lent my mittens <laughs> away. So I was trying to spin with these on. Uh, the, they're getting old. I got to repair these. I was trying to spin with these on, but whenever you try to spin wool with these on with a drop spindle, my the fuzz on my <laughs> thing kept getting stuck in the in the wool, and it wasn't looking too good. So I tried to take them off to needle bind with, and now my fingers are still recovering from the cold. It was actually not too bad. It snowed, so it's a little bit warmer. But then the snow came down the mountain, uh, and when it goes through the valley, I mean the air, when the wind comes through the valley instead of over, it suddenly got really cold really fast. <laughs> and we've all been outside today. Uh, Ann Taylor's here. Hello from central Arizona, where it is mostly cloudy day of 66 Fahrenheit, 19 degrees Celsius. I feel your pain. <laughs> it was... God, does anybody know what the temperature was here? I have to look it up, but I would swear it's uh, somewhere around between minus four and minus 11. Uh, it wasn't bad until it started blowing. It's still pretty light outside. So hopefully next week we have enough that we'll still be light out in the, on uh, at seven o'clock so we can do the whole thing outside instead of trying to run in. We'll soon find out. Nella's here. Ah, Nella. Okay. So I forgot to, uh, I should have printed this and I didn't. Uh, it's a needle binding festival uh, in Odense, Odense. I think they say Odense in Denmark, in Denmark. Um, but it looks like Odense, O-D-E-N-S-E. -E. Uh, Maria Hale is putting it on with some people down there at, uh, what is the name of that Viking village? It's not a village, it's a medieval or something, but... Uh, not for me in a park. I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, I have to get the thing printed up. But I was going to say that is going on, I think it's the 26th and no, 27th and 28th of May, the very last Saturday and Sunday. Um, I think it's like 85 kroner, Danish kroner to come in. And I have approval to go down there. Yay. So uh, from work. So now I just have to uh, get my papers in order and then I can go and I'll bring Carl with me. And Nell is going to be there from Finland, and Ann Decker is coming from United States, and Maria Hale, of course, because she lives there. Yeah, Gammelbu, which means old village, or old town, I believe. Uh, so it should be there, I believe. And I think they're going under, I don't know if they're calling it Noel, Noel Binding Festival, Noel Binding Festival, or Yarn Festival. It's, um, it might be Yarn Festival because they're going to add in knit and crochet, too, in order to open up more for awareness, because... 
it's the same reason why this one became, um, instead of quarantine, nettle binding or null binding, it also became Viking. So we could do Viking and null binding because null binding is very niche, niche. It's a, there we go. Now this is uh, Udensa or something like that. Udensa, yeah. Uh, I have no idea where it is in Denmark. It's flat as a pancake. It probably doesn't take long to get there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it looks like quite a few people are going to be there. Uh, once I get my papers ordered, then I will be ordering hotels. So that'll be fun. Uh, I will bring, um, hopefully, yeah, so now I actually, because of this thing, I have to actually get my patterns printed. So I will have to take my Instagram patterns, put them into PDF, and print them and take them down uh, as well as have them online. And then I'll do one more thing I did ask. I wasn't sure how they want to do this considering they're calling it wool. I will have to do embroidery patterns. I'm making some for the shop here so I can make them for some down there too. And uh, one of them is the one you saw in the front, the um, Urnus style dragon. If you look up Urnus stave church, you'll notice that the head of the dog is going, you know, upwards and not downwards like it is in the print or in the thumbnail that I've used. Uh, but I don't know. I have to look to see actually because I don't think. I mean that 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 figure that I uh, embroidered is everywhere, but it's always called Urnus style dragon. So I don't know that actually that is the dragon or if somebody made us this dragon in the style of Urnus and just reshaped it a little bit or changed the head direction or something like that and then everybody else copied it I don't know but it's uh I actually have that brooch uh with that uh silver brooch with that on there but so I'll make that too and then of course I have to do some of my sheep <laughs> so I'll bring those with uh, I don't think I can carry too much more I'm gonna bring Carl there uh we'll bring our viking clothing which means there's no room for anything else and Anne, I think, is going to hold a lecture. It's just a matter of what. So do you have any topics you would like to hear at something like that? I think we're pushing her to do one on fines. But uh, we shall see. And Nella, are you going to hold, are you going to have a stand? Or are you going to be a, a participant? Or are you going to be a uh, um, wandering around too? You, could, you, you, live, you could drive there too, I suppose, from Finland. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, what stitch are we working on today? I chose up something simpler, um, beer spool. Uh, when they're cleared out in the shop in there, I can run and get the hat that I had. Um, let's see what else do I have first. I can catch up a little bit more in chat. Uh, I'm also killing time till Carl can come in too. Um, let's see, always a pleasure to rip back hard worked null binding. Oh no, Nella. Yeah, the only tip I can say is, let's see, we'll put this down. Whoops, that was stupid of me. Hang on. <laughs> Wrong button. <laughs> okay, that's the embroidery I'm working on now, but okay. When um, I, this is Oslo, so this is easy. When I rip back Oslo, if you hold the top left of the stitch here, then you can just pull from the bottom. And as long as your yarn isn't too full that's about the pain most painless way I can do but if you don't hold it on the left here and then you start pulling it'll start tightening all the previous stitches so you don't want to do that but yep ripping sucks don't like doing it um so the stitch I was going to play with today with more of this pink yarn everything looks so bright I have to lift the camera down it's too high up let's see that's the um, Sutton who embroidery I'm working on. I have to guess at colors because there is no colors. And there are no colors for that one. It's, I think it was on the Sutton who helmet. Carl picked that one out. It's not quite done yet. Um, these are just little templates to tell me what goes there. But there's another kind of sting, thing that you can do where you can draw it on something that's the same type of, uh, if you can see the little dots and things. Um, and when you apply water to it, this disappears. So you can stitch right through it and then uh, add water and it'll disappear. And you have your embroidery left. This one is actually meant to be put on the back of something so that when you iron it to it, it makes your fabric a bit stiffer. So I got the wrong one, but I can do it the same way I do paintings. So you just trace around, draw a line down, and then cut. there. So you can't see it, but there's black lines there for where it goes. But they kind of stick to the wool here a bit which is nice okay beer spool this is an easy one she said let's see first I have to get some yarn 
Ah, Andrea's back. Came from Duluth, Minnesota. It's gloomy and windy with about three to five more inches of snow on top. You're going to hit the 100 mark then. 100 inches of snow this year. I think you've already beat that last week. There's a sort of peace to the weather. I, we didn't have snow here yesterday, and we got some today, so or last night, and I was very happy because when people come to film here at this time of year, everything looks so dead. So it's nice when there's some clean snow. Uh, looks pretty. Okay, beer spool is related to Oslo. I made these in the reverse so you can see it this way is the right way. Uh, but you do one mistake. So, like Oslo, we have to start with two loops. One. Go through everything, and now I have two. All right. So for Oslo, you can continue. It's same thing either way. And then you go forward through these two. So that's Oslo. But with your spoke, you're just going over that yarn instead of under it. That is it. And then you can do the beer spoke stitch. Beautiful. That is a Swedish spelling, so I'm assuming it's from somewhere in Sweden. I'd have to look it up to find out what exactly gave it its name. But yeah, over that one, and then pull through. And for some reason, this is slightly looser uh, than uh, Oslo for me. You could also call it Oslo with a plated edge. Oftentimes, it'll say plated edge on a stitch. Mammon with a plated edge, which means it's not actually the same stitch, but uh, it just means that they went over this yarn instead of under it. So if you can do telemark, you can in Dolby, or if you can do Dolby, you can do telemark because uh, it's the same stitch, it's just that the other one goes uh, over this yarn. Always just one mistake away from another stitch. Yeah, no, so everybody says, oh, how do you know how to do all these stitches? I only know the one. I'm like, oh, if you can do one, you can do lots more. So if you think of it as only one mistake away, that also means if you're trying to do Oslo and you do something different, it doesn't mean you aren't needle binding correctly. It just means that you're making another stitch. And sometimes the stitch has a name, sometimes it doesn't. Like last week, I did check when I was doing the um, cross dolby, I think I was trying to do, uh, and I went through the... There's a back loop anyway, but I went through the back loop when they're facing this way. I went through this way, but it is actually correct. You do take that back loop this way before twisting and doing all the other crap. Uh, so because I took it from this side, it did sit a little bit looser, uh, but I had to then join Zoom's, Anne's Zoom chat, I mean, on uh, Saturday, or on Sunday, my time Sunday, um, and ask her... Um, how do you code that now? Because I have no idea. But it's no longer crossed Dolby. Now it's something else. So it doesn't mean it's not a stitch. It's just something different. It's not the one I was trying to do. <laughs> but that's, um, let's see. That's what gave this result. So this isn't crossed Dolby, but I like it. But this isn't what it was supposed to look like. It's something a little different. And then the inside looked like that. Because I did one thing wrong. So I have no idea what you would call this stitch then, but there you go. They should catch up on uh, chat here. Peruta, hello, good evening from snowy. It's snowy here and supposed to be super wet and rainy. I don't like rain and wet in the snow weather. Winter, I love winter. I love the snow, but I don't like it when it's wet and cold. It's hard to see what I'm doing through a phone. Um, and Taylor, both null binding and quilting have me learning to work on letting go of my perfectionist te uh, tendencies. They can certainly give me a lot of practice. You know what? Some of my favorite things were made as mistakes. <laughs> so they call them happy accidents. I like that term. Uh, I'm trying to think of a... I just had to call a recent example of something that I did that was actually an accident. It wasn't supposed to be that way, but I really liked it that now I do it intentionally. And I have no idea what it was. <laughs> But it could be a stitch, could be something in painting or embroidery, but it looks better that way. So now we have this chain here of a gazillion stitches and stretch it into place. 
So it looks uh, still a bit like Oslo on this side. If you compare the top rows, that row and that one. But on the back side, it'll look different. This is Oslo from the back side. It looks a little bit more plated or braided than Oslo. This is Oslo, then that would be Virspo. One thing, I don't know if this was just me, but if you did the mystery stitch along that I did around the, the beginning of COVID, um, I decided to make a hat, but I made it out of uh, beer spool stitch instead of Oslo. Or no, I mean, uh, no, and it wasn't a hat. Sorry, it was a bag that I made, and I used um, Faubourg, which is uh, like Mammon, but it's just like Mammon and Corrigan, except for that you go, you do that braided edge thing, you go over this thumb instead. And I noticed, though, that the end, I kept thinking I must have my count wrong because the end was, the end row was always, the working row was always really wavy. So I kept having to um, steam block it for pictures so that it wouldn't look bad. And I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong, but I thought I did my math wrong. And God forbid I start all over again. It turns out it's the, the plated edge thing that causes just the end row to do that because as soon as you do the next row, then that first row is not a problem anymore. So we can see if it does the same thing here. Raymond is here, 20 degrees. Oh my God, you people in the warm countries. He's in uh, Australia. They're getting ready for their winter, I suppose. Garcia is now binding a gray hat at the moment in Oslo. Good for you. Uh, let's see. Ann Taylor says, oops, I scrolled a little too fast. Oh, you like my embroidery tip. Thank you. Uh, it's because I bought the wrong thing. So, But you can do it that way. That's how I do paintings too. It's not the best, but it kind of works and you can kind of just check. But either way, I'm going to outline this later. I can bring it up a little closer so you can see it. Hey, Torben and PJ. Carl will be along in a little bit. He's just guiding people out the door. Uh, so yeah, I intentionally did this without outlining it. Sometimes I'll outline it first. If I go really close, you can see the black line that I would have drawn. And as you can see, let's see if I can put that there. And this hilt fell off of his sword. doesn't matter. Anyway, if you can see, his hat has more detail than I bothered to trace here uh, because I'll just cross-hatch it on top. I'll just embroider it first, and then I'll just do some cross-hatch on top or same thing with these little circles. Take another yarn and go through a bit like I did with his. It looks like socks, and I didn't have brown. So I went with the yellow, but I decided to make it look like leg wrappings instead. So I will probably do something similar to that up here when it's done on this part just go back in and this one I might add circles or I might just leave it right now he looks like he's wearing grandma's sweater instead of a tunic so I think I uh it's kind of like a sweater dress from the 80s you know one of those forensic things <laughs> so I might put some chain mail looking thing or I don't know these dots I don't think I'm gonna bother putting in there um it, like, it looks kind of just fine the way it is so we shall see. I think uh, we'll do the leather strap dots in there. But I'll outline it afterwards. Uh, oftentimes I'll outline it first with a stitch, stem stitch, but this time, because it's so small, I decided to, I'll, I'll go through and outline it afterwards. Um, let's see. What else am I missing here? Max says, I've heard of beer spool stitch and I figured it's very dense in the Westman's book. It's called Variant 3. Ah, no, this one's not very dense at all. You can see it's quite loose. It's actually looser than Oslo in, in my gauge anyway. Everybody's a little bit different, but because it doesn't um, cross over this one the other way, I think for some reason, Ann Decker would have like a really good uh, excuse for that. But if I were to make these top down, then I have to do a couple more rows. Thank you for sparing that Biersbo. Beers oh yeah, sorry, Biersbo. Uh, B O with uh, two dots over it, um, which would be equivalent to the Norwegian er, which is O with a line through it. Looks kind of like an American zero. And then uh, S B O. I think I put it in the in the um, detail somewhere or in the info somewhere, so you can see what it's called. Let's see. Susan Youngman's here. She's still in Frankfurt. Yay! Uh, let's see. She was on Anne's chat too yesterday uh, last weekend. So. But it's good to hear you're still in Germany. There's a story behind that. You'll have to have her tell it to you. But happy to hear she's still there. Albert says, has someone made a 
thing with different stitches in one thing. Oh God, yeah. Um, but you'll never be done with it. I took like a, I made like this big, long piece of material anyway, and I put I would make these tubes like this, and then I would cut them in half and lay them flat. And I would name this is Oslo because then you can flip it up and see the back side or not. And then um, you know Oslo mom and whatever, and continue going through. And I did a bunch of them and. You'll just, you'll never be done. If you look at that uh, Nylock and Tot page, you'll see that you'll never be done. Um, if I can find it. There, let's see. If I can see. I have too many windows open. The first part of that, E-N for English, dot Nylock and Tot, dot F-I, and I'm probably mispronouncing it like mad. And then Beerspo is that one, number 109 on that thing anyway. So yeah, just like Oslo, finish one plus one, but when they say plated edge, they're talking about going over the working yarn like you saw. And it says, in Finland, this stitch has been used, oh my God, somebody else can pronounce that, or whatever, um, curly and isthmus, uh, personal communication, I have no idea what that means. Anyway, in Westman's book, this null binding stitch is variant three from Beerspo, Sweden. Uh, that must be what Max was talking about. Um, your supposed stitch is like Oslo stitch, but at the end of the stitch, push the needle over the yarn. And then, then she's got examples of front and back side. Let's see. I can fix this so we don't have to look at the empty office. And then I can go back and see what I'm missing on chat here. Oop, looks like I'm watching two of my videos at the same time. That should be pulling on the thing. Ah, Torben says, it's a cool Viking. Thank you. It's, um... It's, like I said, from the uh, Sutton Who find. I think there's a drawing of it on his helmet, on the Sutton Who helmet, which is so, so full of them. There's another one that's got tusks and a little bit lesser obvious raven there. Aunt Bonnie's here. Hi, I'm going no, to try null binding again. Yay, you can do it. I see a car. I'll grab a chair. That chair is almost broken, though, so let's see if you fall on your ass. I can't find you because my gimbal needs to... Sorry, hang on, people. There, fine. It's now it's calibrated. It's a Carl. So, I told him you were freezing your ass off for TV people today. Have a seat, and we'll lift this up a little higher. And I'll work on my second row. Are you cold? No. No. Fix, fix, fix. There. What'd you do today? Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. No. I heard you fail at insulting a country, though. Can you insult a country? Let's start with Denmark. <laughs> Flat morons. Yeah. That sounds like Norwegians <laughs> who have been to the dentist and has paralyzed most of their mouth. So I'm going to take you to Denmark at the end of May for the needle binding festival. As long as they speak English, we have no issue. I have no issue, so you can insult them? And would you insult them in their own country? That's different than insulting people on YouTube. I insult people in their own country all the time. Okay. What Whenever about, I go to a foreign country. What about Norwegians? Can you insult Norwegians? Yeah, but then I have to be more specific. I have to insult the particular part of Norway that I'm from. You know, I only like you because you know how to insult things. <laughs> um, but yeah, how? let me see your fingers. How cold. Carl has doubled up on his needle binding today. So he's got the wrist warmers that have been repaired on top of the uh, these ones. There's a, there's a pattern for these ones that I put out. A while ago, that's uh, with the creepy Carl. It was right before you and I got together. Mm. So then I was only making them you because I was because you were cold, not because I wanted to have you for my own. <laughs> what are you doing this for? Because you like the creepiness, apparently. I do. I like the creepiness. All right, tell me a story. I'm counting, so you have to talk something. Uh, you have to be a little bit more specific than that. Did Vikings have umbrellas? Uh, probably not. There isn't really much use for it. Unless you're from Bergen. <laughs> There's Bergen. Charlotte would need one. So what do they do to stay dry in the rain? Well, stay out of the rain, first of all. Send your trails out to do things in the rain. And then you if you can't? don't have to. Well, then you'll get wet. Then you'll get wet. But, um, or you could do something like this. But this is speculative. We don't know for sure that they did it. No. But I don't get wet when I'm out in the rain. Because this will, this will collect a lot of rain and get really heavy, mm -hmm. but it, I don't get wet through it. Mm. Peruta says, when I move to Poland, who's coming to visit me? I would totally love to do that. And we're going to try to get to, we're going to try to get to uh, 
Denmark, though. I think we can do that. And I have to put my patterns out at the Needle Binding Festival, which is on in Udense, Denmark, on the 27th and 28th, I believe. Correct me if I said that wrong. Uh, the last Saturday and Sunday. And um, apparently you don't want to share rooms with anybody, so we're gonna, you're going to pay for the hotel. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> well, that'll be okay. Um, and then we'll have to make sure we do some Carl friendly activities. Oh, but Anne wants, a Anne's going to come and do YouTube with us and Nella and Maria and whoever can join on YouTube as well. So we will st still plan to send live on YouTube from, uh, there might do it earlier in the day. We have to see Maria's going to set up so that we have internet, uh, down there so that we can stream because I'm coming with Norwegian internet, which damned expensive after a while. Um, but we could send earlier so that you can see the festival. That would be quite cool instead of after when it all depends on everybody's schedule. Cause like I said, Anne is going to do a, a lecture, I believe. And I'm sure Maria is probably teaching some classes there too. And yeah. Okay. Somebody find a question for Carl. I need to do some more counting. Aunt Bonnie, you can do the needle binding thing. Stick with that. Uh, start with Oslo stitch. I like that one for the most. And use, I mean, look, it's fat yarn. Use this yarn fatter even, and it'll be more sense. And remember to pull your chain when you make it because it might not look right until you pull it. <laughs> but Aunt Bonnie, I know, can do, uh, was it knit and crochet? So if you can do knit and crochet, then you, all you have to do is get the technique down because then you already know how to put it together. You increase and decrease the same way than you would in those other two. Uh, for example, if you're going to make something bigger in crochet or in needle binding or in uh, knitting, you just do two stitches in the same loop. Same thing with this one. And if you're going to decrease, you take the next two loops together. And same thing in this one. So there you go. Um, Torben is here. He says he's back and he had to partake in a major project in Torin's room. It included Hot Wheels track, a toy tractor, and some heavy metal music. It was epic. And we wore helmets safety first. What do you think you did? What do you think? What do you think they did in Torin's room? That involved Hot Wheels. It's the traditional uh, uh, song darling headbutting contest, I guess. That's interesting. I'm not entirely sure where the Hot Wheels come into it, but. Uh, could be. I saw you got your question out. Okay, so we got a question for Carl. I'm going to pick his Viking brain. Uh, there's two of them. Okay. Uh, first, Garcia's. Uh, did the Vikings have horses? And what were they used for? In battle, uh, for battle or for what? Uh, Not just in battle. I mean, what were they used for? The Vikings had horses, and horses were considered pretty high status in the Viking age. They are useful for transportation, and they are also kind of useful as farm animals. Uh, the Vikings don't seem to have used them in battle uh, to any mentionable extent, if at all. Uh, I believe it. There might be more. But I only know of one reference to somebody being killed by somebody on horseback in the Viking Age. And that's the um, famous story about the guy who was uh, standing in such a choppable position that the guy who was ride riding past just couldn't help himself and had to chop him down. <laughs> that could be fun. Thorgrim, I believe the, the chopper's name was. So how hard is it to uh, chop somebody down from the back of the top of a horse? I mean... Well, it's easier because um, you basically strike down on them. But what if you can't reach and them? The horse's momentum counts in addition to this, your swing speed. Yeah. So if you are moving at uh, the maximum speed of the horse and swinging a weapon in the same direction as the horse is already moving, mm. it will hit with a ridiculous amount of force. Okay, and I'm going to expand even more. Would they have had any armor for the horses? Do you uh, think? They are not fighting from horseback, so why would I? That's true. Good point. Um, yeah, no, uh, I was going to say also, when would they have saddles? Uh, yes, they would have saddles, but and the uh, saddles would have stirrups. I was going to say, did they have stirrups, though? Yeah. The stirrups are uh, either invented by the Franks or brought to Europe by the Franks yeah. uh, in about the year 400. So when you see Romans in movies, look for stirrups. If they have stirrups, the movie people just couldn't get good horse people <laughs> or they don't know what they're doing. I remember uh, we were watching some movie and you were in Roman, or some Roman TV show or something was on Netflix or HBO, I don't know, and then you started freaking out. They have stirrups! What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> mm. Let's see. Oh, Karen O'Chris here. Hello. <laughs> 
Uh, Gracia says, thank you, Carl. And Peruta says, question for Carl. What's your opinion of the new find that supposedly pushes back the earliest evidence for Odin, Odin worship uh, by more than 100 years? <coughs> Sorry, I got tickled my throat. Uh, I'm not familiar with the find. Is that the rune stone that I keep talking about? Maybe I know Holger's linked to a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't had time to read, so it might be one of those. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar. Tell us about it to Peruta. I want to uh, see. I'm not familiar with it, and I also don't know how far back uh, Odin worship goes. So, speaking of Viking religion, um, do they only worship Odin, or do they just worship any god? Or It's starting it as a running joke that we all kind of hail Odin here. It, was, it wasn't uh, supposed to be, actually, Odin wasn't the, necessarily the god of choice when we did uh, that. I have to be very speculative. Yeah? Because we don't know this for sure. Uh, it's, um, it's a pantheon. So they basically accept the existence of all of the gods. But depending on what you're doing, some of the other gods might be more helpful to you than Odin. And Odin also seems to be less popular than, for instance, Thor. Uh, maybe if you need uh, Thor's qualities, uh, strength, courage, and uh, tenacity, you will uh, be more inclined to worship or sacrifice to Thor than if you uh, you would more rarely need Odin's uh, attributes basically wisdom slyness and uh, a type of bloody minded cunning uh, also uh, one theory about Odin is that you don't really want to draw his attention. Because if Odin really likes you, he will just have you killed. Because he wants you with him in Valhalla at Ragnarok. Uh, so he will betray you at some point. If he helps you out in the beginning, it's just to basically fatten you up so you're a better warrior when he gets you to Valhalla at some point. He don't want you to grow old. No. Um, would anybody worship Loki? Uh, I would say... Other than Greg? Uh, I would say that's very unlikely. Because we think of Viking Age worship in terms of our time. That they would pray to their gods. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be... The, I have to use a lot of weasel words here because we know so little for sure. But yeah. uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Mm. What you do is that you sacrifice something of value to the god... And the god gives you something that is within his or her purview to give you. So, Njord, the god of sea travel and trade, if you are a trader, you will probably focus on Njord. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are a farmer, sometimes you need your physical strength to get through the workday. And so, so you worship Thor. And sometimes you will need the fertility of the ground, so you will worship uh, either Frey Freya or Njord again. Because he is also uh, wealth in a way, um, but it is uh, and in that context. Even if you want Loki's properties, being a sly, conniving, backstabbing son of a bitch, uh, don't then, hold back. <laughs> uh, you probably don't trust him enough to give him a sacrifice, because he is pretty famous for breaking his word. Uh, or find some very creative legal loophole to basically make it so that whatever you do is uh, to his benefit and not yours. So uh, I wouldn't trust him to keep his word if I sacrificed a horse or whatever to Loki for whatever benefit. I wouldn't trust him to actually deliver on it. Mm. Um, from Peruta's uh, question, by the way, you got uh, Al Albert says it's a bracelet. Nella says it's golden jewelry from Germany, the 400 CE. And Car Karen says they're having a blizzard. Okay, the blizzards are assuming awesome. Assuming they are speaking about different things. No, no, no. Well, the blizzard is obviously a different thing, but the bracelet, which is also you know golden jewelry from Germany, 400, that was the uh, the find that supposedly pushes the Ev Odin worship back by more than 100 years. Did you read anything about a bracelet? Uh, no, I, I'm not familiar with it. Oh, we got some homework but to do. But also, I don't know when uh, when it was alleged to have started before that. Yeah. Because there is this uh, uh, Odin is Woden is Wotan. Uh, and I don't know when that is supposed to have started. Mm -hmm. It is 
it is absolutely running at Tacitus' time, which would be 200 uh, AD, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it probably is also the same gods that were worshipped by uh, uh, the Germans that Caesar are fighting 200 years This week? Uh, Good tourist questions. Yeah. They're starting to pick up again now that it's getting a little bit more towards holidays. Let me see, I got a question today about sauce. Um, sauce? No, uh, so. Oh, saw. A saw. I'm sorry, how's that go? And what if it's more serrated than the other saws? And basically, the Jews in this case kind of had this. It's not incorrect by a modern standard. It's much easier to get planks by sawing them out of a log than splitting them like the Vikings did. Yeah. But uh, in the Viking Age, making a saw blade that can do that effectively would be uh, one hell of a feat for a blacksmith. And as far as I know, uh, somebody might know more about this than I do. I only have found short saw blades from the Viking Age. So they have saws, but they don't have uh, basically a log saw or a saw that is wielded by two guys doing this. Uh, so they split wood instead, and that is also ideal for shipbuilding. For house building, a yeah, saw so would probably be fine. But since they have no water powered or wind powered saws, and everything has to be done with uh, uh, muscle force, and you don't have any saw blades that are long enough to do it effectively, they generally don't saw their planks or die. Mm. So we've been this through down this road before, but we should do it again. Split wood, ship, why? Because when you split wood, you split it with the grain of the wood. So uh, it gets to be much more flexible than a sword plank. Mm -hmm. And how do you make a, how do you make split wood? You don't use a saw, obviously. No, you uh, use wedges to uh, uh, widen link, a yeah. gap. And then you use your axe to kind of uh, put the finishing touches on it. Hmm. But I think you have to like do even, you know, bang this one a little bit, then this wedge, then this wedge, then this wedge, and you keep doing it over and over and over again until it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Bet you thought I was going to hit you with a needle. Yeah, no, I, I was just wondering where it was going. You have to bang this one a little bit, and then you have to bang this one a little bit, and then. I'm sorry, that sounded like a completely different conversation. Yes. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Question for Carl. What is your most recent favorite dumb question? Oh, I love dumb questions. I love, love. There are no dumb questions. There's only more entertainment. <laughs> I haven't had any really dumb ones lately. No? Okay, but, well, since Christmas? I, I, generally, I, I don't consider even questions that show that somebody has a complete lack of knowledge for the Viking Age. Just don't really bother me. Uh, what bothers me is statements that show that people have absolutely no knowledge about the Viking Age. Mm. So, uh, I had a, this is many years ago, but I had a Swedish uh, customer who is looking at one of the Goksta beds and poking at it and going, Nej, ni kunde inte göra sånt här snickare bed i vikingtiden. They couldn't do that type of carpentry work in the Viking town, uh, Viking age, yeah. said the Swede. And you do a really good Swedish dialect. And, Jag visste du kunde svenska. Uh, <laughs> and it is so ridiculously dumb because look at the ships. Look at any kind of wood product from the Viking age and judge their uh, carpentry from that. Mm. And a simple Goksta style bed. I could make that easily. Yeah, it's Ikea. It's basically Ikea. Um, it's because it's just pegs to hold it together. It's like a flat pack. And yeah. you just, I swear to God, Ikea was a Viking god. It's, uh, <laughs> it is so easy that uh, I'm not exaggerating and I'm absolutely not a carpenter. I could easily make one. Well, if you could make an Oseberg tent, the Oseberg style tent is also pegs. Yeah. <laughs> so... But the Gokstad beds are quite nice, actually. A lot of people will make those uh, in Viking reenactment if they're going to spend any length of time 
uh, in a tent in a summer, then you just make the bed frame. You can flat pack it with you. You don't even have to have the boards across the bottom of the frame. You can actually just use a rope and do this kind of a crisscross netting type thing as you lace it through, uh, like shoes. Um, and then you put the mattress on top of that, an air mattress or something. And some questions sounds a lot dumber than I possibly are. I usually interpret things in the best possible light. Yeah. So one thing I've seen, I think three times now, mm. in my career as a Viking guide, somebody is holding my sword because I'm sending it around so that I can feel the weight of it. And then they stand there looking at it and look back at me and go, did I have um, metal in the Viking age? I'm assuming what's happening here is that English is not their first language and are trying to say steel. Because that would kind of make sense. Yeah. We call the period Iron Age. Yes, I have steel. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you, your mistake is that, oh, I think thought the Vikings only had iron, that's an understandable mistake and it is something I probably would have done maybe 20 years ago. But if you are asking, oh, the Vikings had metal, as in everything else should be made out of wood or stone or bone or whatever, well, then that's a whole other level of, um, it's not really stupid, but um, misinformed or uh, ignorant. Yeah, ignorant is a good word. Mm -hmm. So uh, going to flat pack uh, Gokstad books with the um, pegs. Books? <clears throat> Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. No, bolts. <laughs> Not bolts, but anyway. Beds, woman, beds. Beds. I don't know what the hell I was saying anymore. But anyway, <laughs> uh, would they have used pegs more than nails when building? Yes. Why? Because it's like... This is my stupid question. Let me have it. <laughs> like enormously much more cheap than... Yeah. Uh, and you don't have to involve the blacksmith, so that's also a bonus. Yeah. Because not everybody is a blacksmith, and blacksmiths generally want to be paid for their work. It's funny like, they're funny like that. <laughs> so and nails wouldn't be so easy to get a hold of then, I guess. If uh, all you have to do is to get a good knife, mm. maybe an axe, yeah, and then you can make everything else from wood yourself. That is easier than going to the blacksmith with. I need more nails. <laughs> money, 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 more nails. Our chieftain does that. I need more nails, many, yeah, many more nails. He's a chieftain. Chieftains probably did that. Yeah. Uh, apparently, uh, Prudus says, apparently the turf roof on the houses were to provide camouflage from serial at aerial attack. Actually, we've talked about that one before. Though. Yeah, I like serial attacks, but she did write aerial. Uh, <laughs> um, because when you see it from above... Yeah, you to... and you have to... They use this sneaky... Uh, observation balloons to find out where the enemy is and if you can hide your village that's um mm -hmm. i suppose if you were stupid enough to build your village at the bottom of a you know i mean if they're up there in the mountains that doesn't really make it quite stupid because it's too cold up there so we build down here but all they have to do the base jumpers get a great aerial view so they have to base jump from 1600 meters up and then shoot arrows on their way down but because we have turf on our houses they won't find us <laughs> I like this question. I'll just see the chieftain hole and none of the other. There you go. PJ's here, by the way. Just aerial attack, riding dragons. Could they? Of course. Absolutely. If the dragon is rideable, you can ride it. Uh, and anybody can make a wooden pig. Making iron nails is a bit harder. Yep, I agree completely. Yep. Chinese balloons, says Raymond. You know the ones that are going over the nuclear centers in the United States. It's just a, it's yep. just a weather balloon. Sneaky little bastards. Sneaky little bastards. There's one in Canada too. They're everywhere now. Uh, Andrea says, Viking ninja base jumpers. <laughs> mm. Would they be wearing black, Carl? The Viking ninja base jumpers. Well, probably, yeah. And what would they use to be flying squirrels with? What kind of material? You know, wool and linen just doesn't seem like it would cut it for me. <laughs> Seal skin or? Bat skin. Bat skin, there you go. Or the dragon, you know, I mean, because if you're going to ride the dragon, you might as well skin it when you're done with it and make a hot air balloon. <laughs> We're really off the wall here. <laughs> See if I have some more. Oh yeah, uh, the color. Yeah, I, yeah. I was. You know, I always get mixed up if it's gray spelled G A R G R A Y or G R E Y. But Raymond's got it written on there. Gray with an A is American spelling, or gray with an E is English spelling. I suppose that's easy to remember. A for American, E for English. Uh, and that's the color of the month. Yeah. Um, I made wrist warmers for it. I was gonna go and grab them out of the. Sh the well, the shop is open extended hours today because we had uh, 
a group through, so I don't know. I, I left them in there long enough to see if they got sold. But I just made basic wrist warmers uh, like these, but these aren't done, obviously. I just went this far down, and I only went to about here on them, and then I put a thumb on it, and that's it. So it was kind of boring. It's done in alpaca. I've made them before um, in the exact same yarn, too, so I'm sure I might have showed those before. So this is Beersbo. Beersbo stitch is coming along. That is, you can see, it's kind of got a plated look. So this is the right side, by the way. So we have that one and that one. You can see the difference. The red one is, or the orangish red is Oslo, and this is Beersbo. And then, uh, so it's got a little bit of different look. Um, you'll notice that my working edge wants to separate a bit more. This is the working edge on Oslo. It's not really, yeah, see, it kind of sticks out. But I think that's just the plated edge thing because, I don't know, I just kept thinking it was waving, but as soon as you do another row, then it's fixes, so. Oh, and inside out. Because you decide which is right and which is wrong. Uh, slow, wrong side. Beer spool, wrong side. Yeah. Uh, PJ says, turns out I already knew this stitch. I just didn't know it had a name. Yeah, some people do it on accident. I get that in the classes all the time. But um, I'm pretty sure we talked about this one on YouTube once before, but it would have been would have been a while ago. Probably um, in conjunction with that, uh, in connection with that hat. I made a hat out of this when I made a... Um, bottom up hat tutorial i used this stitch so you can see it on instagram okay we need another stupid carl question so he doesn't get bored carl were the sails of the ships made out of wool that's actually a good question we get that one on the uh, yes they were uh, but what kind of wool were they made out of vaudeville this wool uh the boiled wool so i thought holger said they were wanted to be wind tight I, yep. I'm not an expert on the different types of wool, uh, but... Um, Carl's in here! But if you boil, uh, it's just great. If you boil um, wool, you'll get really tight. So, when they had... Hey! No, I guess not, considering all of their uh, camera stuff is here. No, no, they're still out there, I can see. All right, see. Okay, so if you can see... This one, they wondered how they got, they could weave it so tight, and that is because it's not this tight when it's woven. When you wash it, it goes. Pew. You have to hold it down. Wait, wait. Huh? What? What did you want to say, Greg? I'm running away on holiday. See you soon. <laughs> Who let you out of here? He did. <laughs> okay, you gonna tell us a story when you get back? Yeah, I'll tell a story when I get back. Okay. Have a good you time. Can hold me to that. Where are you Thanks. going on holiday? In case we want to kidnap you on your tour. Good luck. I'm staying in Norway. I'm just going around with a friend. Oh, well, crap. Okay, so fine. I'll probably be here at some point. He wants to come to the village, so ah. he'll see me one day at least. So you're going to be tour guide for a friend in Norway? Sort of, yes. Yeah. Okay, exactly. bring him here. Tell us the story. That's all we want. Yep. They're no all problems. saying happy holiday. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, see you next time. See you next time, Bye. yeah. Bye. Let's see. I'll catch more up on chat. Um... Woven sails, uh, oil-treated, lanolin, boiled, heavier, and denser. Yep, that's what I was told, too. If I remember correctly, that um, when uh, Holger was talking about it on his tour, he said, yeah, they used vaudemill, and vaudemill, um, it was extremely expensive. It, oh, God, you can't even see it on this one, but this is vaudemill. They'll make nervous. You can see how tight it is, because it's that's how much it's frayed over the last couple of years. But it's almost looking like a piece of felt because it is boiled. It doesn't help that this is charcoal gray and hard to see. But considering the one I'm showing you here, you can see how much tighter it is. So when um, this one, the vaudemill, is, is made, it is boiled so that it gets really tight, I believe. And then they treat it with lanolin uh, or oil to keep it from, to keep it watertight as well. So I answered your question for you, and I probably answered it wrong because I'm not the one that knows history. But from what I understand, uh, you could buy a slave with vaudemill too. Vaudemill, the type, it's V-A-D-M-E-L. Buy a slave with anything. It's just a matter of how much of the thing you have to give for the slave. Okay, so if you were going to buy a slave, Carl, because, you know, we're in the past the millennium here now, what would you pay Oh, for a Danish know. slave? 
since we're picking on Denmark today. They might have this uh, thing he was doing where he converted everything into eggs. <laughs> oh, um, I need to hear this. <laughs> he, the way I understood it, he found some kind of medieval price lists. And the cheapest object he could find on this price list was eggs. And uh, you got like a hundred eggs for a copper penny or something like that. Yeah. And then there uh, are... So a hundred eggs to a copper penny, it is this and that many copper pennies to a silver penny, this and that many silver pennies to gold, and this and that many gold for a sword. So I, I, don't arrest me on these numbers, but I believe that the value of a sword by women's calculations was 48,000 eggs. Somewhere <laughs> in that neighborhood. Okay, now question for you guys. Oh. Wherever you are from, if you're from France or Holland or United States, Finland, <laughs> Denmark, uh, we got y'all over Norway. In your local currency, not currency, but let's just say whatever you're trading the most, what would you pay for Carl? Uh, considering here I am in Norway, I would say you're probably worth about 60 to 100 sheep. Yeah. For me. And if I was in the United States, I'd say at least 20,000 hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> what would you pay for what would you pay for Carl? I want to know. <laughs> what would uh, what would they use as currency in the Viking Age then other than silver they use silver, they used gold, they used bronze uh, too? Uh, basically a barter based yeah. economy. So yeah. uh, you can try whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, silver is the most popular one, mm -hmm. but uh, I got my bling on today. I don't think the Vikings <laughs> used copper coins for anything. Uh, they might have. Mm. But mostly done because it's no, not a coin, but it's a piece of more or less valueless jewelry to them. Yeah. Um, I have to reread it, but uh, Ibn Fadlan uh, has some kind of. He's talking about Viking women uh, getting one glass bead for every uh, thousand, a hundred something dinars their husband makes in trading. Yeah. So you can basically, by looking at the chest of his wife, you can tell his bank account. We have to update my bronze. <laughs> this is glass beads, not bronze. But it should be on a string oh, the glass between beads. your yeah. two turtle brooches. I don't do it on this one because of the embroidery, because that's how my the embroidery on my snakes is getting deteriorated. It's from the necklace, the chain that hangs in between. So Maybe I should start doing that. Every time I get a thousand kroner in tips, I should go and buy a glass bead. Glass bead, one glass bead for a thousand. They will see you coming and rob you blind. <laughs> no, I'm not buying it for a thousand. No, the okay. The glass bead is just a symbol that I put on you, telling oh, people that to tell I have everybody that you have a thousand kroner in tips. Yeah, but that doesn't make me very, me very valuable. It just makes you look like, hey, I'm using her like one of those what abacus. I'm using <laughs> I you. Count, I can count how old see Karen's fifty years old. So I'm using you here. like a uh, bank statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so my the necklaces that go from here to here is an abacus. <laughs> so uh, when I know that I have made it in uh, uh, Viking guiding, that's when Karen starts complaining about back pains and flips forward. Yeah, no, that's just the weight of my boobs. <laughs> and uh, seventy-eight thousand glass beads. Speaking of heavy boobs, do the Vikings have bras? Don't it? No. But we know so little about Viking clothing that it is. I thought Yeni had uh, found something once where it was a sewn and it fits just basically like a halter top, but it is so tightly fitting. I don't know how the hell they got it on too because they didn't do the lace up thing. But it was supposed to, you kind of work like a binder, I guess. I mean, because those things hurt when you're running. I mean, <laughs> uh, dum, dum. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, the, I believe it's the Minoans. There are some paintings that very much seems like they are running around in bikinis. Yeah. The problem is that the people who restored those paintings originally did it in the 1930s or 40s. Uh -huh. And they did it based on what they could see people wearing in their time, I believe. Mm. Or was it the 50s, maybe? Bikini sounds like a 50s thing. It's a Vikini. <laughs> Okay, no, not a bikini. But um, Prudus says, no, Carl is priceless. Hmm. Stop Thank flirting with my man. <laughs> you tried to sell me, woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carl says, uh, yeah, Aaron Garcia says, you're too precious. Stop flirting with my... <laughs> 
You know, the blacksmith was asking if I wasn't worried about um, letting my man out into the village every single day and just watching these people pay to be in his presence, and I'm not worried about you cheating on me. Like, it's Carl. Why would he, you know? And he's like, and Carl's like, are you kidding? They throw themselves at me all the time. <laughs> so tell me about all these women that are paying to see you in the village every day, Carl. Uh, well, there is a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Some of them have their husbands with them and boyfriends. Some do, most don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, Karen, says, was, uh, Karen says, was value of uh, by weight of metal? Uh, yes. If you think of their economy as based in anything, it's based in silver. Mm. But uh, in reality, their economy isn't really yeah. based on anything, and everything has a relative value depending on what you will get or won't get for it. So we can say that a slave and a horse is uh, interchangeable because they have the same value, which is about correct for Viking Age. Mm. But then you have useless horses and really good slaves, and you have useless slaves and really good horses. And you also, uh, if you have uh, uh, 70 slaves and you just need to visit your brother on the neighboring farm really quick, then a horse is very valuable to you. And your 70 slaves don't get you to your brothers any faster. And it's always decisions like that, basically. PJ says, if you're for sale, but uh, it was great, but sorry, sadly has no sheep. <laughs> I thought that was cute. Um, so this is the one I always show. This is my torque. It is bronze. I'm so sorry. I do want to get a silver torque, but we haven't uh, had one uh, available to us to buy uh, since before the pandemic. But it has a head that's soldered on the ends of them. All of these do, actually. Uh but they, can they start out this, this is always my theory, but I never know if I'm actually correct. Start out something like this as a torque, but then as it, you take off a bit to pay, if you have like a weight, like I've seen they found this little metal, this little horse that is actually not a toy, it's a heavy horse, but it's used as a weight. That horse yeah. means it weighs a certain amount. So when they set up their scales, they put the horse in there and the person has to pay the equivalent in the weight. And then it would, then they solder the head back on and it would eventually... Yeah, no, that's uh, entirely plausible. That you start out with a torque, and then the torque becomes a bracelet, and, and then the bracelet eventually becomes a ring. A ring, yeah. Oops, I'm just throwing my uh, silver. But um, we know that hack silver was a thing. Yeah, because all of them are shaped like this. Why? Um, not all of them are shaped like. No, that. not all of them, but lots of them are shaped like that. And there's the ring you can see has a. Oh, maybe do a little bit further back. Will also be like that. Is yours also, yeah? Your ring has that. The, the reason you have this shape is because that makes it possible to take them off your wrist. Yeah. But what about, then you have this one, which was an unusual one. This one cannot be. You'd have to, like, um, you'd have to heat it and unsolder it, and then, uh, because it's it like was, a band. But something like that in the Viking Age will probably be tailor made. Aha, uh -huh. because it's a. Uh, has to fit just right. We've got people that want to buy them, but they can't get them over the wrists, or people that want to buy them and they're way too loose. Yep. So, and then they're afraid of going like this and having it fly off into the sunset. Um, PJ says, did, did they have, oh, actually, there was more than one question here, but yeah. Um, did they have any textiles other than wool based flax or hemp? I believe. Uh, Silk, obviously, but it's uh, very exotic and expensive. Um, it's in the flax and hemp category, but. Um, uh, the uh, weed, what's it called? The itching. Stinging nettles is a huge thing now that they're kind of getting into. They made uh, they made a fabric out of stinging nettles, apparently. So that's like the latest craze in the Viking uh, com reenactment community to make those. But that's uh, expensive because, I don't know if it would have been expensive stuff. That goes everywhere, but it's expensive now to do because uh, there's not enough people doing it that would have the machinery to mass produce it. Like you can do with linen. Yeah, but they probably wouldn't mass produce anything, including linen. No, not if there's no uh, demand. The for only it. thing that seemed to have been done, uh, have been done in the somewhat industrial scale in the Viking Age, is 
wool and uh, Voldemort's hide the rope. Yeah. There are some references to almost um, factories, probably Slybron, uh, to produce these things in large quantities. Mm. And then Prude has a question about slavery. Were children born into children of slaves? Were they born into slavery? Be it like you know, an old time U.S. Uh, generally, yes, but not necessarily. So, uh, if a man has a, a kid with his slave, then he can choose to acknowledge that kid. In which case, the kid is free and it's his uh, son or daughter. Or he can choose to basically go, no, I don't know how the slave reproduced. Plumber. <laughs> the milkman. Um, oh, uh, PJ says I misunderstood the question. I was asking if they did they, if they did have flax and hemp testing. <laughs> Textiles. I was about to say something completely wrong. <laughs> it was it was uh, tongue tied. Yes. I swear to God, it wasn't meaning uh, to go that way. Flax yeah. is linen and. Uh, Hemp. Uh, hemp. I'm not sure about textiles. I know they used it for ropes, but I'm not sure about textiles. Yeah, actually, come to think of it, I'm not sure about that either. I thought they did, but it wasn't as... It's reasonable, because you can make threads, and you have to have threads to make textiles. But I I don't know for sure that they did, because there is a lot of things to... Yeah, that's actually a pretty, a pretty good question I got from tourists. I mentioned yeah? uh, to uh, tourists I had today, the Norwegian group. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned to them there were that students, yeah. uh, there was a way for the Vikings quite easily to get the color purple by using the plant crocofoot in Norwegian. Yeah, which is crow's foot or no? Uh, yeah, it's a mountain. Well, directly translated to. It's a mountain plant uh, that I could have used to get purple, but we know they didn't because they bought purple with the Mediterraneans like everybody else at this time. Yeah. Or they Probably none of them did, and if anybody did, it was so secret that most other people didn't know about it. Mm. And they were basically asking, how could I overlook that? Uh, the answer to that is that the Vikings couldn't really test everything with everything. So coming up with something like how to make blue out of wood and urine is uh, very impressive. But you can't go around and test everything. And if I take it out at this temperature, and if I take it out at this temperature... And if the Vikings had done that with everything, they would have developed a nuclear submarine because there isn't any supernatural ingredients in anything we have today. So with enough uh, use mayonnaise on totem pole, the Vikings would end up with the same thing. Yeah. I was just checking to see if I got most of the questions here. Yeah, it was some more about the, the textile question, but that one got actually corrected further up anyway. Um, Torben is eating clipfish gratin and has doesn't have any mood or room for anything else. What is clipfish gratin? Gratin. Uh, you know what fisky gratin is, right? I know. Yeah, but they don't. What is fisky gratin? Well, it's fish. Fish casserole, pretty yes. much. Yeah, yeah. Fish and pasta. I mean, the Sultan would call it a fish casserole. No, we'd call it a hot dish. A fish hot dish. Fish hot dish. Uh, this so is a fit fish hot dish with a. Uh, <laughs> particular type of fish that has been you have salted the living bejesus out of it then you kept it around for like 10 years and then you decided to water it down a little bit and boil it yeah it's the same thing the spanish people use in bacalao ah max was saying you tried doing the beaver uh, b1 version instead of the f1 version of the stitch to see if it would get the the wrapping of it down and so basically you would take the connecting stitch from the back side instead of from the front side that could be kind of fun, but these are going to be wrist warmers now. So, anyway, we're after uh, we're af we're over time. Uh, PJ says, oh, by the way, I often wondered how anyone discovered that urine was good for coloring the leathers. The mind boggles at how they found out that how they figured that one. So that one, we have a nice running joke, you and I. Yeah. Carl doesn't let eh, you don't bug you don't bug Carl's tours whatsoever. But I just couldn't help myself because he always ends this one station by saying, and I often wonder. How many weird ingredients did you have to boil to come up with this? And then I just can't help it. I have to kind of pipe up and say, uh, ah, do you really think it was that scientific, Carl? And now you've worked it in, so even when I'm not there, you can ask yourself that. Yeah, and yeah. I do it with, it doesn't really contribute to anything. So I only do it's it just with fun. that yeah. seem to have this type of humor. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And then what do you say? Well, Karen here has, uh, is a strong proponent of the sabotage theory. 
totally. So she thinks uh, that they were just trying to make green, but then somebody on a neighboring farm came over and <laughs> gave a contribution to their coloring project. I'm sorry, you're she's standing <laughs> like this when he says that. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> I was seeing the format of the Yeah, but the this movie, looked so. like a watering can, and I know you're not, anyway. <laughs> Uh, and for all I know, that might very well be correct, because the alternative sounds way too scientific for the Viking Age. Imagine a bunch of Viking scientists standing around a boiling pot and then one of them goes, okay, we've tried fresh water, we tried salt water, we tried different types of oil and we tried with milk. Nothing seems to work. Does anybody have a suggestion? And then from the back row... Have you tried with urine? I can't really envision that for the Viking Age. <laughs> no, I like it. <laughs> so what are we going to do next week? Uh, still more, well, gray. Make something with gray if you want to know what the color of the month challenge was. Uh, yeah, still have a bread maker thingy. God, we have that's weird. we got to do that. We're so horrible at that, but it's been too cold to be at the house. So we stay here until it's time to sleep, and then we go, go to sleep, and then we come right back as soon as we wake up. <laughs> so, no, we definitely have to do that. And then, uh, ah, Okay, so Easter's coming up. It's a couple weeks, so you have some time on your hands here. Easter's coming up, and one thing that Norway likes to do, absolutely nothing to do with Viking Age in this sense, but uh, they have Påske Krim. Påske is the word Easter, and Krim means crime. So they only show movies with crime, detective like Agatha Christie kind of things. Yeah, they and, particularly uh, like British uh, criminal dramas. Oh, yeah. Series. They'll do crossword puzzles, uh, um, all kinds of different things anyway to do with kind of friend yeah. you know so it has been a long time and we can be out in the village by this maybe next week if not the week after but definitely by easter we can be out in the dying village. to see how you want to connect this to the viking it's age. been a long time since we've had trivia so carl does questions and he asks you guys and you just have to keep track and score yourself how many questions would you do <laughs> you want me to make uh, i want you to do trivia again. quiz yeah a new quiz trivia quiz Okay, Viking, it would be Viking uh, themed. I can't guarantee anything because that, that's actually quite a bit of work. Well, it depends um, if we do 10 questions or, and how difficult you want to make them. Yeah, no, but... Because you'd have to have new questions, but it's not like you couldn't combine it with work at some point because we always have something. Yeah, no, the, we used YouTube to test out a quiz at one point. Yep, that uh, was probably two years ago now. Uh, we could maybe do something like that, but yeah. I can't guarantee that it will be done in a week because no, no. But Easter is not until uh, the sixth, the ninth, or sixth to the tenth of April. Yeah. I'm not tying myself down to any deadlines that I don't get from my boss. So peer pressure does work. People beg, beg, beg. I want to see a quiz. <laughs> uh, okay, Max says it's called D one back to front with only one loop on the edge. Yes. Uh, Ann Taylor says, bye, I need to leave, drive across the valley for an original uh, uh, origami meeting. Oh, cool. I will watch again the replay. Um, okay. Anyway, Saturday, next time. We'll see you yeah. then. See if we can't be a little bit warmer. <laughs> see you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.